people are going to the same places, looking for the same things, and if they can't find them there, they think there's something wrong. Yes, there is. You're looking in the wrong place. Look somewhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Underground Kings podcast. Today, I am joined by my friend Lav. Hey, Colton. How you doing? Always wonderful, man. Always. So, um, you are the founder of, is it pronounced Jardin? It's pronounced Jardine. Jardine? Yes, sir. And that is, is that garden or how does that translate? So, the inspiration behind that is two words. Uh, it's inspired from the Fran French Jardin, which is uh, spelled with a J and means garden, as you said correctly. And then me being raised in Greece, I wanted to put that into our brand, so we changed the J for the letter Z, inspired from the Greek word zoe, which means life. So, Jardin is a garden of life. That's awesome. And so, that is a, an upscale restaurant, upscale eatery, uh, located in Market Common. Yes, sir. We're a fast food restaurant, upscale, though we want to create an experience for the customer. Uh, it's something we really realize that here in Myrtle Beach, there's no such a thing. You go in a few restaurants, they have a really good food, but the service is lacking or the ambience. And most of the time, honestly, it's the ambience. Like, you go in a really nice restaurant, great food, great experience, you know, service is awesome, but then you, f you feel kind of cold. So we wanted to bring a little bit of uh, European touch, a little bit of tropical touch in the Middle East because we have the ocean. So why not, you know, go in a restaurant, eat, drink, and feel that vibe. So that's what we want to create, and that's why you walk into Jardin, you feel good just by walking inside. We have all this fresh nose, because we want to represent also our food, which is fresh, healthy, farm-to-table, organic, and starts from the ambience, it goes with the food itself. We really take care of the food, we're really proud of uh, our ingredients. And then the music itself, it's uplifting. So it's the whole nine yards. So you're how far along in this journey of, of starting your own restaurant? So from the day that we open our doors, it's been actually almost four months. From the birth of the idea, it can go up to years and years because I've always, you know, wanted to open my own restaurant from almost a year since we started with Jardine. Like, okay, this is gonna be the name, this is gonna be the concept, we're gonna offer people a healthy option because there's not many healthy options, unfortunately, in Myrtle Beach. The funny story, I got a customer a couple of days ago, she was like, I'm just visiting here, I opened Google, and I Google for healthy restaurants near me, and the top two places were pizza places. <laughs> unfortunately, no, this is Myrtle Beach. It's, it's a place for tourists, but we have to remember that there's people living here. They have an everyday routine, going to work, they're busy, they have families, and the main, the most important thing in your life is, is your life, is being healthy. So they don't have that option, but now they do. That's fantastic. Uh, so I've got to know, uh, what, has, what has brought you to this point? I'm sure it's a long story, but you know, summarizing it as, as well as you possibly could, you're from Greece? Is that right? Correct. So I was originally born in Albania. My parents moved to Greece because the circumstances, they, they went to a different country for a better future. And Greece borders with Albania, so that was, I would say, the closest part. Knowing no Greek, nothing, they just took the risk, took the opportunity. We went there. I was about three years old. So from three until the age of 20 that I left Greece, I was raised there. I consider that my hometown. So I was back in Greece, studying university. Things were getting worse and worse with the economy. And I got to the point thinking of, okay, I have two options. I can either stay here, finish my college, get a degree, and still probably keep working as a bartender, as a server, because that's the only source of income pretty much in Greece. Or I have the other opportunity to take the risk and leave Greece like my parents did. Maybe it's in the DNA, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I most definitely thought it really through. And with my girlfriend, we had the same ambitions, same goals. We wanted to do something better. We wanted to create 
a better future for us and our future family. So we took the decision, moved into the States, and just keep hustling. So where, where was the ori original move into the States? <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> so it was Vegas. Vegas. And I say funny story because I have first visited the United States, I would say, seven years ago. Came just for vacation, 20 days. We went to the big points. We went to New York, Miami, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. And Vegas was the least favorite because I was two weeks before 21 and I couldn't really do anything. So I still had the, the idea of the potential of me coming and, you know, moving to the United States. So I said, if I ever do that move, Las Vegas would be the last place to live. <laughs> and any of being the first one. It was beautiful, though. We enjoyed it. Just being raised in Greece, I was always next to the ocean and something like my body didn't, didn't feel right. Vegas is a desert, it's very dry. So that's why we decided to move and we drove all the way from Las Vegas to Myrtle Beach, three days. Wow. So Vegas, I'm assuming, was a completely different lifestyle than here in Myrtle Beach. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, man. It's full of, full of life, I would say. Now, main factor is that you have all these casinos, all these bars, clubs that, you know, people go, you have people from all over the world visiting every day. It, it, there is no season over there. There's no summer, no winter, no spring, you know, every day is season for them. And it's a great, it's a great thing if you think like from nothing to what it is today. But uh, it was a good experience. That's great. Uh, did you do any gambling? No, nah, I'm not, not a big fan of gambling. No? Or, always that way. I That's coming from a businessman though. So <sighs> you, you, bus you gamble in other ways. I, I gamble into life and I don't, I don't consider it gambling because gambling is like luck. Like, you play most cards, yeah, most of it is luck, most of it, of course. But uh, I choose to take decisions, you know, of how my life will go. I like to plan my life. So gambling is, is I don't know, I mean, some people do it just for fun. They don't do it even for, to win money. I learned probably from my parents, like, you have to earn the money. There's nothing such thing like, okay, here's it. Take money just because you are who you are. So um, I'm actually a poker player myself. I, I've always enjoyed poker. But poker is one of the few, the few methods of gambling where there is a skill set involved. I agree with that. And I never, poker is the only, th only, I would say, game that I never learned how to play. I think you would like it. It's, I, um, it's very interesting. The thing with poker is you, you know, many people will make the argument for the fact that poker is just another game of luck. It's just gambling. But then there's those that continually win that serve as a testament to the fact that it's not. It's a skill-based game. And it's analyzing risk. It's understanding different, different percentages, different situations, body language. There's so many different factors. And I would definitely say that my gravitation towards playing poker and my early on obsession with playing poker definitely has led to a lot of the decisions and the ways that I think in business. You know, it's not just about, you know, what your hand is or what everyone, how it relates to everyone else's, but it's how you're going to play that hand. You know, and I look at that as, you know, a lot of people are born into society, born into this world with nothing. A lot are born with everything. Um, and what you do with the hand that you're dealt is completely up to you. You can play a really shitty hand well. I've seen I've seen a couple of short videos of uh, poker players having the worst possible um, hand and they still won. Why? Because as you said, they they calculate all the risk, all the opportunity, you know, all all the factors. And main thing for me about poker, I think, is psychology. Yes, I've always been very very into psychology because it's how we think, how, how a human being, wh why it does what it does. Because there is always a reason behind something. So by playing poker, that would be a good opportunity to learn about psychology. Mm -hmm. Well, we should play sometime. Oh, I'll be more than happy to learn. Um, speaking of, of psychology and, and motivation, um, what led you, what draws you to the food industry? What drives you to the service industry and, and starting a restaurant? What, 
what kind of factors have played into you becoming that person? Main thing I would say that's that's what I've been doing my, my whole life. Started working at the age of 14 back in Greece. Started from a small coffee place, learning how to make coffees. And then, you know, going uh, to a bigger city, learn how to bartend, bar back, and serve. And after that, on the age of 18, I got really, really lucky to meet the right people. And I went for some, like, summer work, season work, where we say, in Mykonos, which is one of the most popular islands in the world. And I was very lucky to work for a great restaurant, really upscale, really fine dining. I got the opportunity to serve prime ministers. I got to serve the pri uh, princess of Morocco and very, very important people. So that was the moment I really realized how important serving people is. Uh, I, I had those people coming in the table and they would tell me, I want you to take care of my meal. And I had to start them with appetizers, entrees, and salads, and desserts, and per give them a bottle of wine, the right wine with their appetizer, a second bottle of wine with their entree. So all that knowledge and the way that those people saw me, I really felt very, very important. It was a good feeling. So since then, I'm like, I want to open my own restaurant. I want to create that experience because dining should be an experience. Like, as we said in the beginning of our conversation, and that's why we created Jardine, because we wanted to create that experience for the customer. The moment somebody walks outside, they see a beautiful place, they feel good, they want to get inside, see the ambience, they, they try the food, the music, the customer service, everything. And that was the main reason that I wanted to open a restaurant. And then it became a healthy restaurant. Throughout my life, I've always tried to be healthy because you are what you eat. So if you eat everyday burgers and pizza, those foods taste good, don't get me wrong. I eat them occasionally. But instead of giving you energy, they drain energy from you. Tell me last time you, you had a burger and you were like, okay, let's, let's go out now, let's go for a run. Right. So I would say 2020, right before Christmas, I got COVID like everybody else. And that was the moment that kind of woke me up. You see... It's funny because like, the pandemic came and people were terrified. I'm like, oh, such a terrible thing. But then you see other people creating opportunity. So for me, I was in the second part. The opportunity came for me because uh, I got sick and I'm like, wait a second. I thought I was, I was healthy. I thought I was eating healthy. But if that was the case, why did I become sick? So I became vegan alkaline, both me and uh, Christina, my partner. For nine months, we really changed our life. Eating fresh ingredients, organic, really the way of how you feel after eating your food. First time of my life I experienced eating a meal and having energy. I, I couldn't, you know, because usually I would eat and go and lay down. But when that happened, I would eat and then I'm like, I can't, let's go for a walk, you know, let's do something. I had more clarity, I would think better. I was very energized as a person. It helped me as a person, my relationship and everything else. So it was, it was a very, very, very good thing. What role does what you're eating, you know, you said, you know, you are what you eat. So what role do you find that nutrition plays in your physical health, and then beyond that, your mental health. They're all connected. Like, you, you cannot eat junk food and feel good and go train and uh, think uh, smart and have opportunities. To me, it does, as an experience for myself, it doesn't work that way. If, if I see two parts of my life when I thought I would eat healthy and when I actually eat healthy, the first period of my life, I was just having a regular routine. I had the thought like, like if something happens to me, why did this happen to me? Like always, you know, have that thought of like, oh, I'm not worthy. This is not, you know, this is not worth it. I'm not gonna do this. And then the other side was 
once I start eating healthy, like I start thinking better. Like, okay, you know, God gave this to me for a reason. So I would always see the positive side. And main factor was that. And of course, when you eat healthy, as I said, you, you get energy. Now, when you're full of energy, you need to get an energy somehow get it out. So you need to go out for a run, go work out. And once you start doing that and you realize the potential that your body has, it all goes together. Uh, look at the most successful people. Like if you see on the rituals or routines that they have, they all include training. Even if that's running, even if that's going to the gym two hours like The Rock does, or just, you know, do jump and jacks for 10 minutes. It's still exercise, it's still movement. And as Tony Robbins has said in one of the, his uh, speeches, the feelings, they're not actually feelings, they're, they're chemistry in your body. So you cannot, your body cannot be moving and be depressed at the same time. So a, piece, a small piece of advice that he gives everybody, like the moment that you feel sad or you feel depressed, just go for a walk. Instantly you'll feel better. Why? Because you make your body to not feel depressed just by constantly moving. I absolutely agree. I also look at so something probably during this current chapter of my life, um, one of my primary focuses is growing my social circle in this new area. I've only been living in Myrtle Beach for about a year now. But I've really come to understand, I, I went through my... I guess we'll call them my entrepreneurial dark ages, that kind of D and D or do not disturb mentality period of my life where it was all about shutting people out, shutting out noise, minimizing distractions and focusing solely on myself and whatever my ambition was driving me to do at that time. Now this time period was, I look at it as a time period I needed to go through. Um, I, I needed to do it. I grew up in a very small town. Um, there was not a lot of big thinking going on in that area. There were not a lot of ambitious young men, uh, especially not starting businesses. You know, a lot of it was you get your nine to five blue collar job. You work that for 30 years, you retire. Hopefully you meet a pretty girl and you get your house and a dog. Um, for me, I wanted more. I always wanted more. But after coming out of that period, kind of now and being able to, I was building in silence. Uh, I have a, a phrase that I actually have on, that I had printed on a t-shirt for one of my clothing brands that says silent victories. And it's about stacking those victories in silence so that you're able to then proceed. You're able to then come back into the light and be able to once again, go public and start bringing people in. Because I think a lot of people, they try and bring people on when there's, there's no platform. It's like trying to build the house without the foundation. So for me now, though, I'm very focused on growing my social circle, finding high quality, young, ambitious men to get around, to spend time with. And with that comes an under, I, I inject my understanding of health, fitness, wellness, and how much it affects your mentality and your, you know, just your ability to focus on a goal. So one of the things that I primarily look for, one of the first things I'm looking for is, is this individual well put together? Do they look like they are in good shape? Like they're taking care of their body? Does it look like they're eating healthy? Um, do I see them eat healthy? Or are they constantly asking like to go through the drive through at McDonald's? You know, I, I actually look for these kinds of things when I'm almost, for lack of better terms, vetting people to come into my social circle, to be close friends of mine. And I think it's so important to take these things into consideration because someone who is unable to do things like that, you know, when you say you're going to go to the gym, when you say you're going to eat healthy and you don't, you're breaking a promise to yourself every time that you do that. And I know that if they're willing to break promises to themselves, they're probably willing to break promises with me. 100%. I agree with you. I'll start with what we said with the dark ages, like everybody has to go through it, man. Everybody, different levels, of course, but everybody has to go through it because it's a rebirth. That's how I see it. Like, after a storm, what comes? The sun. 
becomes a rainbow, something beautiful. Like um, myself, I've been through very, very, you know, bad situations in my uh, young life, growing up. Itself, moving here, you know, it was such a big thing. Like taking the decision to leave friends, family, and start a new life at the age of 20. That's a huge thing that I, I see now and I am proud. But every of these days was like very hard. You come to a place that you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know the next day where you're going to end up. You're going to stay there. We're like waking every day, going, seeking for uh, for a job. And we're like, hey, get rejected. What do you do? You go back to Greece, you stay here. And that was the main thing you said for the promise. Like we promised to each other, me and my girlfriend, like, we're not going. Like, we'll make sure we'll give our 100% and we kept our promise. And we're here and things come to yourself. Self-discipline is a very, very hard thing, but it's the main thing for success. And success not only being rich, success for yourself. So I'm glad you said about, you know, for your friends, try your social circle, try to be people that work out or eat healthy and think healthy. Because... There is a law called law of average. You are the average of the people surrounding you. So if your friends or those people around you, they're alcoholics, most possibly you'll end up like one of them. But now if that circle, your friends are entrepreneurs, are having a good life, established life, a good home, a family, they're, they're happy, you have nothing else to become but the same. You're absolutely right. And one thing that I know for certain about men is when men are surrounded by other males that are at that higher level or they're pushing boundaries in one direction or another, they are naturally competitive. Absolutely. There is a major competitive, like if I'm hanging around with four guys and all of them are making more money than me, it's going to drive me to make more money. Uh, if I'm hanging around five guys and they're all in better shape than me or they can lift more weights than me, it's going to drive me to work out harder, to eat better, to push myself to that next level. And I think something that so many get caught up in, including myself, especially during my college years, was the, comp it, the competitive nature was there between myself and my male friend group. But the the sport that we were competing in was completely different. It was more hedonistic, if you will. Um, it was who can drink the most, who can score the most girls, who can go to the most parties or go to the most bars consecutively. And it's so interesting looking back on that. And I'm just now coming to this revelation of, you know, the, the guys that I was surrounding myself with, we were still witnessing that competitive nature but it was just directed in the wrong way because I was surrounded by it meanwhile you know n now in my life I, I am I feel that majority of the people that I'm hanging around now most everyone that, that I'm with actually every male that I currently hang out with they either go to the gym or do some level of fitness routine you know maybe it's running or crossfit or this or that every single one of them does that uh Nutrition, you know, that's something that I think a lot of them lack on, but it's one of those things where a rising tide raises all ships. You know, if we're all working out together, one or a bunch of us are eating well and one's kind of falling off and eating fast food a lot, you're, they're probably going to gravitate in your direction. I agree with you. And uh, I see that every day at work too, when I, uh, I have customers and I see them and I, I ask them how their day goes and they're like, oh, it's okay. And I, I want as a person when I leave this world to to have done something better, to help as many people as I can. And by help, I mean giving me a piece of advice most of the times because life is very important. Like, you should wake up in the morning and feel grateful. Somebody didn't have that opportunity to open his eyes in the morning. So just by opening your eyes and having another day, that's another chance. So when people tell me, like, oh, it's just another day, I'm like, did you wake up in the morning? Yes. Somebody didn't. So instantly they realize that and they feel better. And it's a great thing of a great way of seeing life itself. And for the friends that you said, 
I try to do the same thing. I try, I, ideally I would like them to pick me up. I always try to be the dumbest in the room. So I, I want to learn, I want to drain all the information they have to make me become better. But there are occasions I have friends and family, like my younger cousins, they, I see them doing something that's not good for them. And I try to tell them like, this is not going well, well for you. I think you should try and eat healthier. Or if, if me and a friend was like, hey, let's go out for dinner. Let's go at this certain, you know, steakhouse. I'm like, that's cool, but why don't we go in this other place? You know, we can, we can eat healthy. One, two, three times, they'll say yes. And when they do that, you try to interact with them and try to make their habits better. So it's a take and give a thing. Like you take from your friends and you also want to give them something. You want to make them better. In different parts, you might have a friend who's better at the gym. So he'll push you to become better. Lift more weights, be stronger, live the right way, not hurt yourself. You might be better into eating healthy. Like, hey, bro, let's... Let's go get a salad. Let's go get, a, you know, get something healthy. Let's go get a nice protein shake, you know, instead of us going to McDonald's like we do every day. I uh, absolutely agree with that. And uh, going back to your statement about being the smartest one in the room, I've recently come to think of that a little differently because I always used to say the same thing. But now I've, I've come to realize it's about... I think of it as I compartmentalize it as every friend within the group, every individual that you're working with or, or, you know, trying to build with. Everyone has their own space. Everyone has their own room. In reality, you're, th there's this long corridor of different rooms. And it's a give and take of, and this is why surrounding yourself with these people brings you up in so many different areas of your life because like you said, maybe you're, let's say you definitely know more about nutrition than I do. I may know, know more about lifting weights than you do or, or the physical fitness side in the gym. So when we are in my room of talking about physical fitness in the gym, I might be the smartest one in the room and then you're learning from what I have to say. But then the key is, I need to leave my room, leave my comfort zone, go into your space where now all of a sudden you're the smartest one in that room and you're able to contribute to everyone else and to their knowledge. In the same instance where, you know, for me, marketing is, is definitely something that I've chosen to specialize in in life. So for me, when it comes to individuals within my, my circle that are starting businesses, when the, mark, the conversation around marketing comes up, which it always will if you're starting a business, I have insight that I'm able to offer and able to help them grow their business. But they may know more about business than I do. They may know, know more about logistics, about accounting, finance. Um, so really just having everyone have their different skill sets and their different rooms and making sure that you are all taking the time to visit one another's rooms and learn and ask the right questions and drop the ego. Drop the ego and be willing to accept that someone else knows more about a certain subject matter than you do. It's very important to know what you're good at. As you said, you know your expertise is marketing, you know what you're doing, but it's very important also to, to be coachable, to always be like an empty book, ready to write a new story, like always, even if you know like, hey, I'm the best on this part, always listen to what the other person will say. There might be a certain information that might be important. If it is, keep it and use it. If it's not, dump it. But um, I realized that because younger I was very, very, my ego was huge. I thought I knew everything I think all, all the guys go through that phase, you know, <laughs> in that age. So I've always had to say my opinion. I've always had to say something. And I've called myself multiple times. Being in a conversation, I had no idea, but I always say my opinion. And then growing up, I realized, like, that was the dumbest thing, you know, I've ever done. 
like why would I lie? Why why would I lie to myself first of all? Like I know about that because lies, repeatable lies, become reality. Your your brain does not understand lie or the truth. So if you keep saying the same thing, you keep the same, having the same thoughts, you'll believe them. It will become a reality for you. That's why you have you know most of the psychopaths. For them, that's the reality. You try to convince them differently. No, that's the reality. So growing up, I was very lucky getting the right people in my circle. They were always older than me, which I think is a key factor. And that's why many people talk with me and like, when I tell them I'm 26 years old, they're like, what? No way. I'm like, yes. So I've always tried to be with older people, having more experiences than me so they can share their experiences. I loved going, uh, going for a walk by myself. And I remember back in Greece, I used to walk by the port and I would always find some old people sitting sitting on the bench by themselves. So I would go sit next to them and open a conversation and I would just hear their stories. I would hear about the regrets they had and one of the main regrets like not taking the risk. And I keep listening to that from all these people like, wait a second, if somebody who's 70, 80, 90 years old keeps telling me to, that they regret taking risks, I'm like, maybe if I take risks, I'll have a better better future and that's what I keep doing and learning always learning and I was in an event and the trainer said in a motivational event personal development that really helped me a lot and he said look yourself at the mirror like you realize you have God gave you two ears one mouth and you still talk more and listen less like do the opposite listen more and talk less. And since then, I've been trying to just open my ears, get all the information that I get from all the friends, all the people that I open conversations, filter them. I'm like, this is important. This seems like something I might use in my life. So I, I remember it. I, I keep it as a note in my mind. And if something is not important, I will just throw it in the dump. You can teach through your words, but you can only learn by listening. And I, I find that very interesting. And then, and then there's also the conversations you have with yourself. You know, the, the internal conversation that you're having. It's Those can be either great, man, or they can be terrible. That's right. They can be very destructive or, or very constructive. And what I've come to terms with, and I'm still not good at, I, I am not good in the slightest at... Having conversations with myself, they tend to um, they tend to be quite negative. But what I've come to learn is that you have to get good at listening to yourself, to listening to your own internal voice, and also separating yourself from that voice. You need to understand that that voice that you are hearing in your own head is not necessarily you. It is basically this, your way, your brain's way of internalizing all of these external factors or these fears that you have, some of them being primal fears. And basically it's you, what you think you're, you think you're talking to yourself like that has to be me. But a lot of times what that voice is telling you isn't you, you know, it's, it's like, Oh, like you're a worthless piece of shit or you're never doing enough or you'll never be enough. But you have to learn to separate yourself from that and, and look at it as if that were another person saying that to you so you can deal with it accordingly. Like, no, actually, I can disagree with you. Which then it gets very interesting because then you're, you're looking at like multiple personalities. But, you know, it's something that's always very much intrigued me. There have been many times that, you know, I, I thought myself like I'm crazy. Because, mm-hmm. you know... But uh, a couple of years ago, I don't remember who said it, but uh, it really made a point to me. Like that voice inside you, you have to, I would say, you have to start loving yourself. Once you do that, like you know who you are, what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you can improve, what you can stop doing, all the bad habits, you know, create new habits. So that's what I started doing. And then you said separating that voice, I'm kind of on the opposite. 
I take that voice. So I remember as a kid, you know, watching the cartoons, you have the evil, you know, small evil mm -hmm. talking to you and the small angel. So I personally have both these voices. Sometimes they encourage you. Yes, you can do this. You're worthy. You can, you know, you can do anything you want. And sometimes you have the other voice. I'm like, you know, you're not worthy. You're not never gonna succeed. You're not gonna do that. You're gonna fail. But my point and the hardest thing is like, listen to the one voice when it's talking, and for you know, don't pay attention when the other one is talking. I I, I see that mostly, not mostly, but most of the times I would say that when I work out. And I, I try to always push myself because that's what we're at, you know, pushing ourselves and see our potential. So I might be really tired doing, let's say, push-ups and my voice is like, oh, yeah, you, that's it, you're tired. But then when my, my ego hits, I'm like, no, I'm not tired. I, I will keep going and I will keep going and that's what I do. And sometimes when I feel not certain about the future, about a decision, and feel scared, the other voice comes with like, well, what do you have to lose? You know, why, why don't you do it? Like, you know, you're, you're 26, go for it. Or, you know, even, even if you fail, you know, you get an experience, you learn it. And I choose to listen to that voice and keep doing it. That's how I see it. You listen to the one that helps you, and you ignore the other one that wants you to stay where you're at. I like that. I like that a lot. So moving on to uh, another subject matter, um, I've had the pleasure of being around you three or four times now, and uh, one thing I have come to notice is you certainly have a good fashion sense. And so, how do you how do you think about the way that you dress and the way that you present yourself? Like, what are what are some of the thought processes that go into that as a businessman? It's the most important thing for me. I've said uh, the same thing. We had an interview for, uh, um, for Jardine and somebody was talking about the food, like, oh, it looks good. I'm like, of course. Like, somebody is sometime in this, you know, have said that the looks, you know, it, that it doesn't matter. I'm exactly the opposite. Like, you know, that, that's, that's the biggest lie ever invented. Believe it or not, or you want to think it's true or false, we first see. That's the first thing you do. You, you see. So... You see somebody how he's dressed. And then your mind goes like, okay, he's dressed nice. So he's somebody that has potential. He's something, you know, somebody important. Maybe he's worth my, my time to listen to it. You see somebody who's dressed poor, and by poor I mean not taking care of himself, or you're like, do I really want to spend time? Because it's really what you want to achieve in life. Like, you have a goal and you're running towards your goal. You have people that you want to help you. And when I see somebody who's taking care of themselves, and it's hard these days, when you have to go to work, and then most of the times you have to have a second job, and it, if you have a family, you have to take care of the kids, and, and so like, like, like I've always really uh, embraced women. Like I'm like, how do you take care of yourself <laughs> and do all this makeup? Like, I'm proud. Like sometimes I need to, you know, shave or take uh, go for a haircut, and I'm like, oh my god, it takes so much time. <laughs> so, but you have to, cause it's really important. I've realized that through my life when I was not taking, I was not always like this. I always, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to feel comfy, but comfy is not good. Uh, sometimes you have to show the other person, like, I am worthy of your time. And one of the factors is like, take care of yourself. Because to put a nice shirt, trousers, shoes together, have a nice watch, or go for a clean haircut before you meet somebody, it takes time. So that other person sees that through your looks. I'm like, oh, this guy or this this lady, you know, she she spent some time or he spent some time for me to get his attention. So I'll spend some time with him. So for me, it's very important. I absolutely agree. And when it comes to, like you said, looks and appeals, so. That's a, a lot of a conversation that, that I'm having with clients of mine where, you know, we're maybe managing their social media presence. We're putting out content and Gary V. I love the guy. I, I love Gary V. He's, he's one of the individuals that got me into what I'm doing today and taught me a lot. 
he preaches the absolute opposite when it comes to a lot of those things. He, th- he thinks, you know, it's more about just being self-aware, having humility, and just, like, your Instagram feed isn't a art collage or whatever, however he represents it. But it is. It is because, you know, I, I went down that road for a long time and wondered, well, why, why aren't I seeing the success that he's having? Well, I can tell you right now that his content was very, very well put together and had a certain look and feel to it when he first started out. Yeah. He also was building a brand in a different era of time. And, but looks matter the way that you are perceived matters and like it or not we now live in a digital era as well so your social media presence your your accounts even for you your personal accounts these things matter you know when when someone says oh i met so and so at a networking event and let's say they go to their instagram and they type in your instagram and it comes up and it's just not well put together. You just don't look like you have an interesting life, like you're not doing anything significant. Um, you know, their perception of you is changing in that moment. So I think translating that as well to the digital ecosystem is important for a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, because you're trying to formulate these relationships with people. You're trying to establish respect. And you have to understand that your online presence is going to be a touch point at some point or another. I always tell people, you know, it's, it's insane what just having a couple well put together photos on, on your Instagram feed can do for you. When, all of a sudden when you send, and maybe it's someone you've never met in person, you know, you, let's say I send somebody a message to ask them if they want to come on my podcast. I'm doing nothing wrong. In fact, I'm doing nothing but offering value to them to give them a platform. But they may go to my profile and be like, this guy can't be for real. Uh, this guy can't be serious or he can't be successful. So, you know, maybe they, they don't bat an eye at it, but that's some of my thought process. So with Gary V, I, I love Gary V. <laughs> so he says the opposite, but for him, he has succeeded and he's where he is because he puts the work. Like on the end of the day, that's the main thing, do the work. And that's what he preaches. He tells everybody, just create contact. Like this is the this is the era we're living in it. Social media, TikTok was very famous. He was like, people are like, oh, but what should I post? Like, Just post, post, post. You know, do the work. Like that's the key factor of success. On the end of the day, now having good looks, having a well put together feed, or you know, in your Instagram, Facebook, or all the social media, it's an extra. And these days, fortunately or unfortunately. People spend so much time on social media and it's the era of, you don't have an actual ID now. Like your ID would be your social media, yep. your Instagram profile, your Facebook profile, your Twitter profile, your TikTok, whatever you're using. So like it or not, this is what it is. Like me having a business, uh, I'm an upscale fast food restaurant and I want to show that to my customers. And I really want to do it the right way. I want to put, you know, photos of my food, of, you know, people, our customers, the ambience and everything for them to understand, like, wow, this is the restaurant that I really want to go and have lunch or dinner. So it's very important to grow as a business and thinking as a competition only. When everybody does it, I'm like, you cannot just say like, hey, I have the, the best food, I have the best, you know, restaurant or this is healthy and just put something plain in the plate and just take a simple photo and upload it. Like, if it, to me, if it doesn't look good, it doesn't taste good. And the opposite, if it looks good, it tastes good. Because it goes back to what I said, it takes time for something to look good. Yourself to get dressed, it takes time to put the clothes that you put, to create a nice food. It takes time and care for you to put everything together where it needs to be, to have a nice, Instagram feed, it takes time to organize everything and put it in the right place. You, you care about it, and that, that, that goes beyond. What would be some tips, some, some actual actionable tips that you would have for young, ambitious entrepreneurs when it comes to style and dressing? And 
feel feel comfortable. Like I see people they have certain Instagram influencers they like and they wanna copy paste them. That's good, but it's even better if you put your own style, put your own touch. But these days, kids are afraid of uh, what other people are gonna say. I never was like, I mean, I, no, I'm lying. I used to be like that, but in some point, I'm like, who cares? And it came out like, if I like how I'm dressed, it shows so people like how I'm dressed. But when I put some clothes together, I'm like, I don't look good, and you go out, because it's all about energy. You, you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel good on what you're wearing, you're not gonna look good to other people. You might put a simple t-shirt, shorts, and go out with all the confidence, and they're gonna look at you like, wow, you know, you, you look good. It's not only about the clothing, or the, the, the style is not only the pieces of leather and cotton you're wearing, it's about how you carry that. You see people wearing brands, and I'm like, wow. I have people wearing Fendi, Versace, Gucci, all together, all combined. It doesn't look good. It might be worth, you know, like my whole wardrobe, but it doesn't look good. And you see other people dressed nice, simply, and they look awesome. Why? Because they feel comfortable. They, they carry themselves. So uh, my personal advice would be, like, always, like, it's good to have few models that you want to follow, but put that personal touch. Put your yourself there, put your, your signature. That's why all, all the brands, most of the biggest brands, why they have succeeded. Because the designer, he put his own touch. Did he care what other people were gonna say? You're like, no, this is what I designed, this is what I like. You know, people go buy his $500 t-shirts. <laughs> I think when, when people are, I know exactly what you're getting at when it comes to, I, I'm definitely not a fan of brands talked about that briefly. I like things that are very minimalistic, simplistic. If it is a brand, maybe it's a, an expensive article of clothing. I want it to be very low profile. But you see these people that are wearing, you know, they've got the, the Gucci t-shirt with the Balenciaga hat and you've, they've got the Yeezys and the Burberry jeans. They've got this whole thing going on. And all these different brands are basically just plastered in expensive brands. And yes, their outfit might cost ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. But the reality is the types of people that are doing that, they're compensating for something, a lack of confidence. They don't feel good with themselves and they, they choose to wear a piece of clothing that costs a certain amount of money to show value for other people. Correct. Like for me, it's the opposite. I, I know who I am. I love myself for who I am. So I can go out with a nice t-shirt, simply as that. I can go out with a nice shirt, polo shirt. I don't have to buy 500, 1,000, $2,000 of uh, t-shirts to go out. No. So I, I like suits, don't get me wrong. So <laughs> I'll have a nice suit and I was um, for certain events. But it, it goes where I said like, you have to love yourself. You have to feel confident and just go out there and don't care what other people are gonna say. If you like how you look, trust me, people are gonna like it too. You're absolutely right. You look at you know, even very nice brands. Um, you know, There's different spectrums of articles of clothing that they have too. And I think that you, know, you mentioned this before, you talked about utilizing perhaps a luxury item as an accent to your outfit. And it's like similarly with the fact that someone might wear, you know, just kind of a clean cut, non-branded outfit and then have a nice watch on. It's, it really acts, it, it, it's so much more powerful. It's so much more clean. It's so much more concise. And it, like you said, it portrays confidence. I, I can recall times where, you know, I would go to a special occasion. I would wear my nice, one of my nice suits and I would have all the confidence in the world reality was it wasn't the suit necessarily it was the way that i choose to carry myself and because i've i've had the same interactions with people the same level of respect from people going out to a a nice restaurant or going to a gathering with shorts and a t-shirt on because it was all about 
how I felt about myself in the situation. If I go to a wedding and I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt, I'm not very confident in the fact that I'm the best dressed in the room and I'm going to carry myself differently. Uh, meanwhile, if I have nice cleats and I'm going to a soccer game, I might, it, it's a totally different atmosphere. It's a different item. So I think a lot about, you know, the selection process as far as what you're going to wear, what's in your wardrobe. I think it's important. It's important to be prepared for different situations, different circumstances. Yeah. I agree with that. But then you have on the other side, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg. They have just a t-shirt and, you know, they worth billions and billions. They could afford to buy all these boutiques, you know, all these uh, clothing brands. They still wear a just a simple t-shirt, Walmart t-shirt. Why? Because for them, it doesn't, they don't need any value to add in themselves. They have their value. They know who they are. They know what they're doing. So, I don't know. I, I choose to dress nice because I like it myself, first of all. Yeah. I'm not gonna dress nice to impress somebody else. I impress myself. I, I feel comfortable, I'm good, I'm going out with it. I, I know just by me feeling good, they're gonna look good. What, what has been one of your biggest failures? And what did you learn through that failure? Failures. I, I don't use that word. So for me, it's very hard to think of something. I might say the only thing, if you consider it a failure, is like I, I started uh, opening a business with a really good friend of mine back in Greece. Uh, it was kind of like a trend, but we couldn't separate friendship from business, which is very hard. So for me, that was a good lesson. So that's how I see things. I don't see them as failures, but as lessons. You either learn or you either win, you succeed, which both ways is win. So I learned that relationships and business are very hard to combine on a certain circumstances, but most of the time it's easier, I would say, to avoid them. I agree. My, f my first business was, it was a custom t-shirt printing business while I was in college. And um, I went into business, started the business 50-50 with my closest friend at the time, or one of my closest friends at the time. And um, it came to, to a point where he felt he, was, he, he should be compensated more when I thought the other. And then I remember him coming to me after lunch one day and he said, um, hey, you know, I want 70% of the business. You can have 30 um, I feel like I'm, I've worked more for it or I can buy you out. Back then in those days, my ego got the better of me and it was more along the lines of, well, fuck you then, I'm going to buy you out. So I, I, I actually I drove to the bank. I withdrew the, the cash that basically equated to his 50% of the company and I went to his dorm room. I walked in the door. I threw the, the wad of money at him and I walked out of there with my equipment and that was that. But I, you know, we ruined a friendship. We ruined a good friendship and I just didn't know at that time how to separate personal and business. It's a very difficult thing to do. It's very difficult because to achieve that both or um, depends the members, but if it's like your occasion, you and your best friend, you both have to have the same goal, the same ambition, the same work ethic which is very hard to achieve. And then ego comes in the way, like, as you said, oh, I think I, I did more. Oh, but wait a second. I, all this time I thought I was doing more. <laughs> no, you need to, sometimes you need to step back. You need, or the biggest mistake people do is like they talk in that moment. Like, you know, when something happens, you're, you're angry. Like you, you let your emotions control you, which is very bad. I learned that the hard way. You have to, okay, there's something happens, there's an issue or a problem, good, take separate ways, think it through, and try to see from the other person's perspective. The same thing helped me at least myself also in my relationships. It's very important because business and relationships, I think most of the times they, they're identical. So how to do in one, you should do in the other one. So just by stepping back and be like, wait a second, he said 
he felt undervalued or he said you know, he's working more. What if that's true? Think about it. But no, most of the times our ego is like, no, and who are you? And I had this idea and this and that. You know, stepping back, think it through, take some time, take fruit drips, you know, think it through and then meet up again and discuss. I'm like, you know what? I hear what you say, but I disagree or I agree in some point by this and that, but instead of you by my or this and that, let's, if you still want to do this, let's sit down, let's share responsibilities. This is what I'm going to do. You're going to be responsible for. This is my responsibilities and let's promise to each other we're going to do it and keep communication. Communication is the fact. So, that leads me into another question that I've been meaning to ask you. So your partner, you two are, this is your girlfriend or are you married? It's my girlfriend, fiance, I would say. And then there's also another partner, a friend of mine who's, uh, who's investing. Okay. Um, so your, your fiance, as far as having a, a female in your life, having someone who is obviously very important to you, how have you navigated balancing running a business and, and pursuing all of these ventures? How are you able to pursue that while still giving that loved one the attention that they need? Because that's something that I know a lot of people struggle with, including myself. With one, it's a lack of time. And second of all, it may, when you even do allocate time to it, it can be a low quality because you're so t- you're exhausted or you are you're mentally somewhere else. So how do you deal with that? So it it's very important. We both sat down and we said, "This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna stick for it for a certain amount of time to see if we're gonna achieve our goal, and we're gonna have each other." We said we're gonna separate our relationship from the business where. When when we're talking business, we're talking as both partners. When we go home, you're my love, I'm your love. And we like to talk business in the house if it's good things, if it's opportunities. If it's about issues and problems, we don't want to carry that home. Like that's the time, which is very limited because being a business owner, you don't have much of the time. (laughs) But those couple hours that we have together, we spend them for us. We spend them with our dog, we're going for a walk, we work out early in the morning, we go for workouts together. And the main thing is because it's both of our goal, is this, we have the same destination to go. And that's why it, so far it's, it's been great. It's been a great journey and it keeps going. We separate those two things, business is business, relationship is relationship. Of course, sometimes you can avoid, you have some conversations that influence each other, but we both remind each other like, hey, this is something personal. We're not gonna let it interfere with our business. This is our business, this is our future, this is our potential to achieve our ultimate goal. And understanding is the main thing. When she comes to me and is like, hey, we haven't gone out for a while, I understand that. Next week I make a schedule, I'm like, we're going for dinner tonight. You know, like, do surprises. Like, you know, I book a, ma- a massage for, for one hour. And unexpectedly, I'm like, today we go home. You're like, what am I going to do? Like, just go, get ready, and go over there. And she enjoyed it. It's those small things that we have to do, but we tend to forget because we're busy. We're looking one direction. But it's been working great, great so far. And how... How long you said you've been with her since you lived in Greece? Yes, we've been wow. together five years. Wow, that's phenomenal. It is, and the main thing for us being still here is we started as friends, so we liked each other for the personality that we are, for the person, the human being that we are, and then we start liking each other for the appearances and loving each other, and that's a very very good thing, and I've. I've heard that from many successful couples, and by successful, I mean they've been married 60 years or more, and I, I always ask them, you know, like, we're friends. That's what it is. When, when you're friends, that's the main thing, because we understand each other. When a friend comes to you and they're like, hey, this is my problem, you don't tell him, like, go fuck yourself. This is your problem. You try to understand and help him out. Same thing is with a relationship. 
one of the mistakes I used to do is like, ladies, women are more emotionally people. So when she comes and tells you like, hey, when yesterday when that happened, I felt, I felt bad and I didn't like that. You don't go and tell her like, no, you, well, I don't care how you felt or whatever. Or you try to convince her how she felt. No, she's telling you how she felt. You should listen and try to see if you can do something different. If, if you on your side can change something. Because feeling is a feeling. You cannot tell somebody like, oh, you don't feel angry now. I am angry. <laughs> you cannot tell me that I'm not angry. But the point is like for you to understand what make you angry or what make you feel sad and see if you can change it. And, and you're right, you know, women are, women are m more emotional, generally speaking. Um, you know, I find that you know, the, f the feminine spirit is much more, they're, they're much more able to live up to their potential when they are free to do so. And they work better, I think men work better within confines within within certain bounds or within structure like we set a goal we set benchmarks and and checkpoints or, or achievements that we want to hit along the way and we go we are very mission and objective oriented meanwhile a lot of times that can be very suffocating to a woman or for me my obsession with accomplishing the mission a mistake that i have repeatedly made in my lifetime with the women that I have been with is I would, especially in my younger years, I was so obsessed with it and I could not bring myself to understand why, like you obviously care a lot about me. So why aren't you getting on board with this, you know, these kinds of things, but coming to terms um, more recently with the fact that I don't need them to be necessarily on board with the daily execution towards that mission or objective. I just need them to support myself and who I am and trust that I am pursuing something worth pursuing. It's very important to understand that you might be with somebody who might li like the same thing. You both like sushi, you both like seafood, you know, you both like the same movies, but at the same time, you're different creatures. As you say, like, I'm very detail oriented. I'm, I have OCD. I want everything to be in line. I want everything to be perfect. And my girlfriend, she's a free spirit. And you know, like in the beginning, I would get very frustrated. Even now, some days, <laughs> I'll be honest. But again, I, it's what I said before. Like I step back, and I tried to step on her feet. I'm like, okay, she's a woman. This is who she is. Like, and that's what I love about her. Who she is. So I'm not gonna try and change her. As far as you know, it's not, a, it's not something that causes me something bad or our relationship. Some habits are just habits. Some people do different. Like just because I go in the house and I take my clothes and I fold it and you know, put it nice and neat and she just throws it in the, you know, in the laundry, that doesn't have to make me you know, see our relationship different. I love her for who she is. And that's what we need to do sometimes. Like we we tend to fall, not to fall in love, but we want to marry, like, let's say, our female version. There is no such a thing. <laughs> I, at least, I, I, I don't think there's such a thing. Like, you know, I don't either. I, I, I don't think I would like that sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no. It, I have always appreciated women who embody the, the feminine spirit or the feminine nature. That, that they're free-spirited. I've, what I've struggled to do is to understand understand how to approach it and how to turn off my masculine voice when I'm speaking to them. And so, you know, if, if they come to you and they've... I, I can actually, I can think of an instance with, with a former girlfriend of mine where I had just had a, the day from hell in business. You know, I was working grueling hours. They had just been, you know, an entire week of 12 to 14 hour days, usually like 12 hour days. I was just physically and mentally exhausted. And then I went home and then 
met up with met up with her later in the evening and she came back and she was extremely upset about something that had happened at work or or no it was one of her friends one of her friends was this that or the other thing you know how women are sometimes <laughs> but um in that moment I lashed out and I was just like you know I was just I was angry I wanted to be left alone and it was just like so I lashed out and then she was very upset but I I realized later on I was like you know that was that was me taking my my masculine brute force and trying to push that on her when in that situation the best thing I could have done was just just listen just listen I don't have to it doesn't need a response not every conversation requires you to respond sometimes it's really just listening that's the main thing uh, I totally agree with you man you need people to sometimes just just listen to what you have to say not everybody has somebody to tell how their day was how terrible it was or how great it was I would rather hear how the day, how great somebody's day was than terrible, but you need to be there too Correct. every time. The same thing would happen with my relationship, with my girlfriend. Like, we all have bad days. And, you know, she'll come back from work and she'll be like, how was your day? And I'm the type of person I, I don't want to fill you with negativity. Mm -hmm. If something great happens in my work, if I met a great person, if I had a great conversation, if something happened, if an opportunity was uh, given to me, I will come home, you know, smiling and share it with you. But if, if it was an ordinary day, somebody complained about their food, you know, somebody was uh, complaining about the wait time or complaining overall, I'm not going to transfer that because that's just me. My girlfriend would be the opposite. She, because, you know, she takes it personally. Like, she she feels bad and she carries that over. And, you know, every time I go home, she would tell me, like, how's your day? I'm like, oh, it's good. And then, you know, she would start her day and, in the beginning, I, it, I would get frustrated, as you said. I'm like, why do I have to listen to that? Like, you know, like, and I told her that, like, main thing was, like, when you're coming home, like, you had an experience at work. It made you feel bad at that moment. You kept it all day. You brought it here. You're describing the same occasion again. So you're going through that emotional uh I was with that emotional again. So it's like you're actually living the same moment. Like, why do you do that? And, but I was thinking as me. Later on, I realized, like, man, that, that's what makes her feel good. That's sharing with me that bad thing that happened at work that made her feel sad and made her feel, uh, you know, anxious or stressed or whatever that feeling was. And all I have to do is just listen. Once I realized and I started doing it, I, this one's just about listening because some, some guys are like, yeah, on their phone, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's actually listening. Active listening. Yeah, because one, two, three, four, you know, a couple of days later, you might know that I'm well with, with you too. Right. Because you're not paying attention. It's, you should see each other like your other half. Like, as important you are to her, she's the same important to you. But these days, most of the guys, I, I don't know, is it because the way we're raised or the way society works, they don't appreciate women that much. I agree. Like most of the times they use them like, like trash. Now, sometimes women themselves, they carry that, you know, that character. They're, they're warranting it, for sure. There's so a lot of that. There's a lot of that. I think, you know, the, you know, I think the blame falls on both sides equally, yeah. in my opinion. Um, women as well, you know, you, you look at, time periods, women today, you know, for one of them to have had a multitude of partners, of sexual partners, it's quite common. Yeah. And, you know, you go back just 70, 80 years ago, that was not the case. They may have had a few partners throughout their life, um, and many of them had one. You know, so really this, this shift from a monogamous society to a polygamous society is, is quite interesting. And I think it plays out in a lot of different ways. I hope as well that, you know, we can see a shift back in the other direction as we see some of the fallout of these kinds of things. And another thought that I have as well, going back to what you were saying, saying at the beginning there about it, you know, it's, it's a 50, 50 is 
with that comes, and this is my personal opinion. As a man, you, you know you are with the right woman or you know that that woman could potentially be the right one for you. The moment that you know that she will never make you choose between your mission and her. That's 100% true. Uh, going to the monogamy and polygamy thing, yeah, like that's a that's bad truth. Like I'm, I don't like it at all where it's going. First of all, because I was raised in such a way, my mother made me always respect women. I have a younger sister. So since a kid, she was like, you have a sister. So every time you have a girl, remember of your sister. How would you like somebody to treat her? So, and that's what I did. I'm like, I've, I was always honest. I was always, you know, I never, never liked to count. Like, it, it goes with what you said, like, you know, about your, uh, your previous circle, like you guys were counting who's gonna go to the most clubs, who's gonna get right. drunk the most and stuff like that. These days it's like, both for guys and women, like, oh, how many did I have until of 20, 30, 40 years old? And that's why the divorce rate is so big these days. You're absolutely right. Like when, when you've been with so many people in your life sexually, do you think you get satisfaction anymore? You lose the appreciation and you lose the understanding of what sex within the confines of love is. It's, it's the connection. And now when you've been connected with so many, so many other people, yeah, you always come to compare your current boyfriend or girlfriend with somebody previous and like, oh, he was better. So you instantly take the value from what you're counting and you don't leave the opportunity to grow for him to show you what he's really worth in. And p people say like, oh, you know, like I, I'm like, a, like an asshole magnet or a, like, like, well, you choose to be. Do you give the opportunity to, for somebody to grow and really show you who the potential of him becoming the best of it, becoming your future husband, your future wife? No, because you always compare with other people and you always keep looking for more and more. Like we, we are very greedy. But sometimes you have to give time and pay attention and you know, give the opportunity for the other person to evolve and show you who he really is. So. And it's back to what we were saying about growing your social circle. You know, a lot of the, the strategies that come with meeting new people, high quality people, is location-wise, where are you putting yourself? And how are you, goes right back, how are you presenting yourself? How are you dressing? How are you speaking? And how are you acting? Because those are all going to be direct, a direct correlation to the kinds of interactions you're going to have. If a girl is dressing half naked and going to the club. Yeah, and then she's like, I, I can find the right one. Well, where are you looking for him? Correct. Did you ever go to a park? Did you ever go to a library? Did you ever go to a coffee place? Instead of you going to the club, you know, the same thing, I, I had an interview a couple, uh, couple days ago. Uh, there was a very good lady. Uh, she, uh, she approached me for some, you know, marketing opportunities. And she had said that, you know, it's very tough these days to, to find the right people. And I'm like, where are you looking for? Mm. She was like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah. like, you're looking for the right person, okay? So that right person has certain characteristics. Be healthy, like eating healthy, reading books, watching movies, you know. So you should see those characteristics and like, okay, where would the person like that hang out and go to those places. Now, if you keep going to the bars and you can find the right one, you're looking at the wrong place there. You see, that's, I, I find myself with all my relationships in the right places. Like, I never went to the club to find a girlfriend. I went there to have fun with my friends. Mm -hmm. So, and if I happened to meet somebody, I wouldn't have higher expectations. Correct. But then when, when I was looking, let's say for, for a relationship because you know we're guys we feel lonely and then like, okay it's time for me to get in relationships but <laughs> it doesn't work like that <laughs> so i would go to you know i would go for a walk 
and you know just happen to meet somebody and open a conversation and realize that we have same uh, same dreams same goals and, you know keep going from there you know, people are going the same places looking for the same things and if they can't find them there they think there's something wrong yes there is you're looking in the wrong place look somewhere else absolutely i could not agree more with that and i also think you know i, I reference to young men a lot because that's a lot of who my audience is and if you're a young man, I've, I've always said this to, to any of my friends. I hold myself to the same standard. I've always believed in the fact that you, you want a certain tier of woman. You want her to be all of these things. You want her to be beautiful. You want her to be smart. You want her to be caring and loving. You want her to be a good candidate for a potentially future mother. You're looking for all of these things. And time and time again, I, I, know, I know young men who demand all of these things of a woman but are doing nothing to work on themselves to facilitate the grounds for that relationship to grow or flourish. It goes both ways. You're totally right with that. Like you, you cannot expect somebody to give you everything and you give nothing. You, you should give what they want to or give what you want to give them and you'll get what you really need. It goes both ways, everywhere. You cannot, I don't know why people think like that. If you want a woman that's healthy and in good shape, you better be eating healthy and in good shape. You should be pushing your limits. If you build it, they will come. Oh, yeah. It's the law of ours, I said, you know, like, if you hang out with, like, brothers and sisters, you have the same mentality, you know, you're going to have the same conversations and the same with, with friends. Like, you met, I, had, I heard this a couple of days ago. Like, if you have an obese friend, even if he's, like, miles away and you talk to him daily, you will end up being obese. Like, it's, it's crazy. I don't know how that works, but I thought of, like, if that's true, then I really need to be careful <laughs> of who I'm hanging out. Because sometimes we don't pay attention of people that are far from us, you know, right. like they, they might be toxic, but we don't care. We're like, oh, he's, you know, he's not here, but no, it, it really, really matters. And that, that leads me to, if I have an individual in my friend group, you know, I've always, always at any given point in my life, there's always been one person in my friend group who maybe they're going through a hard time. Maybe they just never really cared that much, but are, they are physically letting themselves go, as, as I'll kindly put it. They're, you know, they're, they're overweight, they're this or that. I have always been brutal to those people. Like, in my, in my opinion, the, the one thing that everyone doesn't do because they don't want to be cruel or mean is exactly what that person needs in a lot of cases. I got into being healthy, into nutrition, into fitness, because in high school, I had friends that called me scrawny, that called me, you know, twig, that, you know, all these different things. That's what drove me. So I think for me, you know, if a friend of mine is, you know, let's say they're kind of letting themselves go, they're going through a rough patch. If we're, if we're sitting there at dinner and, you know, they're having conversations, oh, you know, I'm just my weight, you know, this and that. Like, oh, I've been trying to do this and that. It's like, get it together. You're getting fat. I care. I wouldn't tell you if I didn't care about you. Like, I care about your health. Or, I mean, my father even. I've had conversations with my father about his health countless times. Like, you're, you're getting overweight or you're getting unhealthy. You got you to get this together. And I do it because... I care and I love that person and I want them to be healthy so that I get to have more quality time with them. I, mean, I, I, I agree. Like love is brutal. I learned that from my mother. She would always, you know, every time I would do something bad, you know, she would smack my ass. <laughs> and back at the time, you know, I would get like, why? But now I appreciate that because, you know, she cared about me. She wanted to make sure that I get that information, like what is good and what is not good for you. And, Something these days that I don't like is 
people are not authentic, they're not honest. I've, I know people that go and every time you go, they're like, oh my God, you look good, you look this and that, and you can tell from the energy that they're just saying it, they don't mean it. Or, you know, let's say a friend of yours, you know, break up, break up, breaks up with uh, his girlfriend and you're like, oh, yeah, she left me. And then instantly your friend will be like, yeah, she's such a bitch. And yeah, you, this. I'm like, no, I'm the opposite. I When I make friends, I tell them since the beginning, like, for me, being friends and being good friends, uh, the main factor is honesty. I'll always be honest with you. If I see something I don't like, I'm going to be the first one to tell you. Mm -hmm. Even if that's something on yourself, like as you said, you're leaving yourself, you're, you're getting fat or you're, you're crying after something that happened you don't have control of or whatever that might be, I'll be like, hey, you're wrong here. And that's what I do now. I have friends, my friend, he, he broke up with his girlfriend. She said this and I'm like, man, I, I understand you, but to what you tell me, like you also, you know, you're an asshole. You treated her like not very good. Or there are other occasions she's been like, I mean like, you're right, like, you know, like the way, like when you go home, tired, working all these hours, you know, trying to provide a better future for you and her and all she wants is more time with you and she's not doing anything and then when you invite her to go somewhere, she doesn't show up, like, like yeah, it's not your fault. And I don't necessarily care if you want me to tell you always, like, pet you. Yep. I'm not going to be their friend. I'm going to, for me, a real friend is somebody who tells you the truth because that's always going to get you higher and improve yourself. I, I'm, I'm right there with you because that's, that's the kind of criticism that's going to at least enable them or give them the knowledge that they need to improve upon themselves so that they don't make that same mistake again. Yeah, because if, if you lie to them, you're going to dig that hole deeper and deeper for them, you know, to bury themselves. But if you tell me like, hey, you're, you're wrong, you're an asshole here, next time he's gonna treat a lady, he's gonna be like, or whatever the occasion might be, right? He's gonna think it again, you're like, wait a second. What if love told me it's true? What if I was an asshole? What if I didn't think this right? That might change his life, so. That's what I want for my friends. I want them to be good. I don't want to have them just to say I have friends. I want them to, as you said, the same thing with your father. You want your father to be healthy so you can spend more time with him and more valuable time. The same with my friends. I want them to stay friends and I want to build that friendship into honesty and being true, like, hey, this is who I am. If you like it, let's be best friends. If not, it's all right. So let's move into our, our final segment here. Um, what I'm going to do is just kind of rattle off some questions at you. Some of them might be random questions uh, and get your responses on them. So the first question I always like to ask, you already kind of hinted at what your answer was earlier on in our conversation. But when your time is up, what is it that you hope to be remembered for? What is it that you hope to leave behind? I want to make sure I personally, I give my 100%. Always give my 100%, whatever it is what I do. Like it or not, give my 100%. I want to help as many people as I can. I want somebody to tell, like say, like, love said something to me, changed my life. He said something to me, I started my business that I was afraid all these years, and I succeeded. He said something for me and I didn't break up with my girlfriend because I was putting my ego higher and now we have a beautiful family with kids. Whatever that might be. Like, uh, that's why I've always say my opinion. I've always, whatever I go through, whatever experience I've been through, I even if that's personal or in business, in relationships, I say it. Because if you think about it, we're all human, right? We all started from the same... Adam, and we're all the same. So if it works for me, most possibly it's going to work for you. If somebody is successful, you can be successful too. You just need the right guidance. You need the right tips. You need to follow certain steps. So if you have somebody to give you that information, that's a help. 
So that's what I want to achieve. I wanted to really help and touch as many people as I can in their personal lives, in their business lives, and wherever. I'm still 26, too young, <laughs> but keep going. Do you plan on having children? Oh, yeah. Family is very important for me, man. It's like, I think we came for this world to create. That's why I, I believe we are our own God. Like, I believe in God. Someone might say, like, what are you talking about? There's only one God. Yes, there is only one God, but he also created you with the ability to create, visualize, uh, that you create ideas, and, of course, create life. There's a male and a female together. They, cre they create, you know, family, and family is very important. I'm kind of anxious about that because it, it's a tough thing, you know, like, until you become a parent... You don't know how parents think and the stress, the, the amount of, you know, uh, love and uh, fear they have. Because when you're by yourself, all you have to care about you. But when you have children, you have to care about them. Their health, if they have a house, if they have food in their table, you know, if they're going to school, they get education, if they're well. So, but I definitely, I love kids. And I've said I want two boys and two girls. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, that's... that's God a, bless you. Yes, I've always said because it was me and my uh, my sister. So I would see guys, you know, friends of mine having brothers and their relationship, you know, having a guy. Because guys are into sports, are into, you know, different uh, things. And girls are more into, like, uh, you know, going to the ballet, dancing, singing. So the perfect scenario would be two boys, two girls. The two boys, you know, they, they have each other fight, you know, help each other. And for, for me, having a brother is very important because you get in trouble, I got my bro. Right. You know, and you have somebody to rely on. And the same thing for a, for, for a girl. Like, if you have a brother but you don't have a sister as a, as a, as a girl, you don't have that companion that a, a, a sister will give you. Because the bro will be like, you know, like the masculine, you know, I got you. So each have, you know, a brother and a sister, the brothers will protect the sisters, the yep. sisters will be more caring, and hopefully my boys don't become assholes. <laughs> so. uh, I know my brother and I, we, we beat the shit out of each other more times <laughs> than I can count, but it builds character. Oh, yeah, man. It does. Uh, I don't, if, if you end up having a son, you just, I feel, I feel that every son needs a brother. Um, I think brotherhood is... I can't even begin to explain how important it really is and, and the dynamic that it can play and the way that men grow up and the kind of men that they grow up to be. So one reason is like what we said before about best friends. Like I want my kids to be best friends with each other. I hate when I see siblings these days. They don't talk to each other. They don't know each other or they don't support each other. I'm like, on the end of the day, you're the same blood. What do, what do you mean you don't care what is your brother or you haven't talked to your brother or sister for like months or even years? I would never imagine that. Okay. I talk with my family almost every day, at least three, four times a week. You know, I call them, even if it's for five, ten minutes, like to see how they're doing. I talk to my sister and it makes me feel good. Like that's what family is about. So, I agree. So, um, let's see. What is, what is a, a physical challenge that you plan on pursuing or that you are already currently pursuing? I want to stay very focused and disciplined on my fitness journey and really take care of my nutrition and my workouts. And I think I'm ready to, to see my body in that ultimate. Like I really, before... I die, I want to see the potential that my body has. That's why I, I try to put my body in all these extreme conditions. Extreme heat, extreme cold, working out and try to, you know, put as much weight as I can. It's, it's very exciting. I, I really love that feeling. Like, I, I think through suffering, there's something that, it was, it's like a rebirth. You always, you know, give and, be, and you become more every time. And that's what I love. So you must like David Goggins then. I, I love his attitude, yes. <laughs> I mean, sometimes he's, he's too oh. brutal, but, you know, I, I love it. Like, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m., you know, everybody's sleeping, he goes for a run. It, it's knowing he doesn't care, shitless. 
Like I want to get to that level because it's really is about mental fitness. The having control of your mind and your body for me would be, I would say, the ultimate. Which I'm that's what I'm trying to get in. And you know, you can achieve that eating well, exercising and meditate and read books. I think those those four as Jim Rohn says, you need you need three hobbies, one for your physical condition, one for your mental, and one for your soul. Three book recommendations for young men. Wow, that's so many. Because you can either say there are books for personal development, there are books for business. So I would say my... Uh, one of my very first books, it's called How to Make Friends and Influence People from Dale Carnegie. It's a great book. That's where I uh, really learned uh, to see from other people's perspective. Because you have to do that sometimes to realize, you know, why they're thinking how they're thinking. And it really improves your, your social skills and, you know, your, your life overall. Another great book uh, is... Should I put the second one? So Tony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. That's a really good book. It's it's a little bit big, but it has very good points about how to improve yourself and how to improve your life. And one of my favorites that is personal and business would be hmm, that's a tough one. I would say science of being rich. I can remember the author of it now, but it's it's very small, but uh, it's very good. It has some points about how the economy works, and you can really get anything you want in life. You only need how to know how to do it. Small steps that you need to follow. Great. How do you deal with fear? Fear. I think fear is always there for everybody. Like, you, I don't think you can take fear out. But what we can do is, like, you can enjoy it. Like, one of the f my fears were fear of heights. But what did I do? I went for budget jumping. <laughs> I enjoyed it. And then, you know, I was fear of jumping from a plane. What did I do? I went and jumped from a plane. So I've heard once, uh, you need to dance with your fear. Like, really. And that's what I've been doing since then. If I'm afraid of something, I go do it. And that fear, even if most of the times goes away, like now I enjoy jumping from the plane. I'm a very adrenaline rush person. But even if it's still there, that fear, it doesn't bother you because you've already experienced it. And that's why I said before, like I want to put my body into so many you know, like extreme conditions because if you can overcome that, then... You don't have nothing to fear about. So that's what I do. I just dance with it. What would be a word of advice that you would give to another individual looking to start their own restaurant or succeed within the food industry? Uh, make sure you have a really good idea. Make sure you're very well planned. Like think of every single detail in advance, that will save you a ton of time and money down the road. That's what I realized with our restaurant. You need to be well planned, have the right connections, because connections is it's everywhere. You know, It's social connections, the people that you know, because they're gonna be a handful when you need them. And the restaurant industry is really caring caring about the product that you serve, caring about the customer that you serve, the experience that they have. That's all about. And if you're new into it, every day is a learning process. Every day something will happen that we, you, it will make you wiser and smarter into that business and in every business. So. And lastly, uh, can you tell the audience a little bit more about your location in Market Common? where they can find you out on social um, and any promotion or plugs that you want to put in there. So 
we are located in uh, Howard Avenue, 3077 Howard Avenue in Market Common, right on the main street. Our neighbor stores will be J. Jill, the clothing store, and uh, the dancing school. We have Sunglasses Hut ne near us, too. So, as you said, we're a healthy restaurant. We have salads and parables. We source organic ingredients. We give a farm-to-table experience. We have some signature dishes that our customers can choose that have been selected from our chef. And every single dish is inspired from different parts of the world that he has been. Or they have the choice to make their own. They can create their own salad or parable. We also have protein shakes. We have cold press juices that we make because you cannot offer a healthy meal and not have a healthy drink to go with that. They can find us on social media. Instagram, Facebook is Zardin Healthy Eatery. Z-A-R-D-I-N, which, as we said, means Garden of Life. Our website is www.zardinexperience.com. They can scroll through our menu online. They can find our online ordering. So if somebody is busy and they don't want to skip the line, they can always place a takeout order. They have full access to our menu, so they can, again, choose something from the signatures or create their own, and it's going to be ready at the pickup station for them. We are also changing our menu every season because main thing for us is to have fresh ingredients and work with local farmers and you can only achieve that by having seasonal items and we also want to keep it interesting for our customers we have customers that come in three four times a week and i mean no matter how good the food is like after eating three four months you're like well i need to try something new <laughs> so we're very ready to launch our new menu which is very very tasty we're also going to have because winter is coming is cold day, so we're going to have a soup of the day that our chef is going to be changing constantly with uh, using fresh ingredients again. And everybody's welcome to come and try us. Awesome. And I can personally attest to the level of experience that you offer. Um, you know, I've, I've been two times now myself, uh, <clears throat> and it really is. It's, it's more than just a place to stop for, for a meal. It is an experience. Um, it is an all-encompassing experience. It is absolutely phenomenal, and I would highly recommend it to anyone. I'm very happy to hear that because that's exactly what we want to create. Experience for the customer. I want every customer to leave the door and feel good. So when he goes home or the next day, he wants to have the same feeling, and he needs to come again and you know get the same, you know, get the food, the experience, and have the feeling because we need more positivity in our life. And that starts from how we get treated, from what we eat, and from the people that we get surrounded. I absolutely agree. Lav, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Colin. It's always my pleasure.